Ladies and gentlemen, Lumbini, as you all know, and as we say, the fountain of world peace and Buddhism, stands as a center of interfaith and holds the prospect to become a center of excellence for Buddhist studies as well. That's what we believe and would put forth to you all. This conference, ladies and gentlemen, in line with this, shall witness presentation of papers by erudite Buddhist scholars and researchers on various sub-themes during the two days that we are here, beginning now, and which will be published as proceedings of the conference. We would now begin a deliberation, or we would begin uh, setting an agenda for the deliberations and the discussions for the two days by a very important keynote speech now. The speech is themed at the search of ancient Kapilvastu and is based on a very rigorous research. And before I uh, leave the floor for the, our keynote speaker, our distinguished keynote speaker, I'd like to request the people at the center, especially uh, the friends here, to kindly sit down and not block uh, way for the uh, presentations. Also to our uh, friends from the media, apologies for the inconvenience, but for the convenience of our audience, for at least 30 minutes, I'd like to request you to kindly sit down or just, you know, move to the sideways. Saying that, ladies and gentlemen, allow me to invite to you our keynote speaker, Professor Robin Conningham, UNESCO Chair in Archaeological Ethics and Practices in Cultural Heritage, Durham University, the United Kingdom. Sir. Venerable patriarchs, uh, monastic uh, eminences, venerable monks, respected nuns, uh, honorable minister Adhikari, state minister Buddha, uh, Vice Chairman uh, Metia, uh, the chair of this, um, uh, Venerable Professor Vice Chancellor Bajacharya, also uh, Vice Chair, Excellencies, Ambassadors, former Ministers, uh, former Ambassadors, and also Members of Parliament, and Secretary, uh, Secretary Devkota. Um, and friends and colleagues, it is a privilege to be presenting here to you. Um, it is a privilege to speak at such an important time to such an important audience. And also, I'm aware that it is a responsibility to communicate the findings of the archaeological work to such groupings like here. And finally, my largest challenge is to keep to 30 minutes speech only. So I will attempt to do that. If I uh, slightly go over, I hope you might uh, indulge me. Um, and also, this is part of a two-day event because there will also be a visit to the site of Tilrakot Kapilavastu. So the focus of the keynote is on the search for ancient Kapilavastu, um, next slide, please. And I send you greetings from another World Heritage Site, Durham, my university, which is a living World Heritage Site, a World Heritage Site, which is also a living place of pilgrimage. Next slide, please. And of course, pilgrimage within Buddhism has a much earlier tradition because the Buddha himself advises Ananda that there are four places of pilgrimage. There is the place of his birth, the place of his enlightenment, the place of his first sermon, and then finally, the place of his passing away. Now, what is interesting, although those are seen as four major sites, next slide, please, by the time of the third century BC and the Emperor Soka, all of the dots on the maps show actually the Emperor Soka was sending inscriptions and edicts to many sites. Some of these are administrative, but far more than the original four. These are very important sites. Next slide, please. And the Emperor Soka, although he recorded key data on his inscriptions, actually there is a challenge because the very early 
Inscriptions of Ahsoka do not describe what Kapilavas do or what Lumbini actually looked like. So here is a piece of Gandharan art from Pakistan, and this is the birth scene of uh, the Buddha at Lumbini. But if you look at it, this is purely a birth scene seen through the Hellenistic world. Next slide, please. And here is the perspective from that area of ancient Gandhara of what ancient Kapilavastu looked like. This is Queen Maya's dream with the elephant above. But as again you can see, the description is purely Hellenistic. This is not Indic in any way. This is a very different imagination. Next slide, please. So we have to start looking at some of the earliest historical records which are brought to us from the two Chinese pilgrims, Fa Sen and Wan Zhang, because on their pilgrim itineraries in the early centuries, they record their journey through the Buddhist landscape. Next slide, please. And of course, it is their itineraries that led to the rediscovery of many of the Buddhist sites which had become embellished and in some cases forgotten. So pioneers like General Cunningham were able to use the Chinese pilgrim descriptions to unlock the historic landscape. Next slide, please. And indeed, here in the area of Nepal, the first of the unlocking occurred at the site of Niglihawa, because there, in 1895, Führer, Dr. Führer of the Archaeological Survey of India, discovered the inscription referring to one of the previous Buddhas, the Kanakamundi Buddha. Next slide, please. And of course, because the Kanakamundi Buddha's place was to the west of Lumbini, it meant that archaeologists could then start to look east and search for Lumbini. Next slide, please. And this, of course, led to this very historic photograph. This is 1896, the discovery and confirmation of Lumbini here in Nepal as the birthplace of the Buddha. Next slide, please. And indeed, General Führer um, uh, and also General Rana there at that point, and the inscription which confirms both the place and the name of the site as Lumbini. Next slide, please. Here is the mound all that time ago before the archaeological excavations at Lumbini. Next slide, please. And here, of course, is Lumbini today, after a hundred years of excavations with the current Maya Devi temple. Next slide, please. And of course, a place of increasing pilgrimage. Over a million pilgrims visited this year. Next slide, please. And UNESCO, with funding from the Japanese Funds in Trust, and also with support from the uh, uh, Ministry of Culture and the Department of Archaeology, Lumbini Development Trust, started a new program. Next slide, please. And that program was looking at both how to complete the master plan, next slide please, how to conserve the important monuments, the Asokan uh, pillar, the Maya Devi statue, next slide please, but also the root of understanding how best to strengthen the management, next slide please. And then finally, archaeological work and discovery at the site. Next slide, please. The highlights of these were discovering that Lumbini dates back to 1300 BC. That is the earliest settlement in Lumbini. So by the time of the birth of the Buddha, Lumbini was an old settlement. Next slide, please. And also the excavations in the Maya Devi temple, which first allowed us to understand more about the Asokan temple. Next slide, please. And this is the reconstruction of Asoka's temple. White walls, brick floors, and a roof, and around a tree. Next slide, please. But then we also learned that before the Emperor Asoka, there was an earlier brick-built temple already constructed around the tree, 
And under that temple, next slide please, the earliest shrine dating to the 6th century BC, a very simple timber fence constructed around the tree in the 6th century BC. Next slide, please. Now, this was, of course, significant for many people, but also it reached a level of international recognition and it was one of the top 10 discoveries of 24 from the American Society of Archaeologists. Next slide, please. More than that, it produced a risk map so that development infrastructure for pilgrims can be built at Lumbini without damaging irreversibly the very important Buddhist heritage there already. Next slide, please. And so guidelines were able to be created which protected but also enabled the upgrading of pilgrim infrastructure at the site. Next slide, please. And this is the transformation that we see today where for pilgrims there is a hugely enhanced experience but the archaeology is not damaged. Next slide, please. But then what about ancient Kapilavastu? Because in a way, much of the focus has been on Lumbini, of course. But in a way, within the life story of the Buddha, his first 29 years, ancient Kapilavastu is equally important, particularly because it is the rejection of the worldly life which is of such significance. This is one of the imaginations of what ancient Kapilavastu looked like from a Burmese perspective. Next slide, please. And this, of course, is from uh, Sanchi. This is another imagination of what ancient Kapilavastu looked like. But archaeologically, what was ancient Kapilavastu like? And that's where the focus of our work has been. Next slide, please. Now, as soon as Lumbini's location was discovered, all of the Chinese pilgrim itineraries identified that it was to the west. So that is where the search came. Next slide, please. And indeed, in 1899, P.C. Mukherjee from the Archaeological Survey of India found a site that he identified as ancient Kapilavastu, the site that we know today as Tilorakot. And he did a magnificent plan of it in 1899, identifying a rectangular fortified site and stupas at the four quarters. Next slide, please. What is most significant about this is the topography he recorded is very similar to the topography recorded by the Chinese pilgrims, particularly Farsan. So this is uh, Deeg's interpretation of that. The plan of ancient uh, Kapilavastu as described is similar to the plan that one experiences when one visits Tiloroko. Next slide, please. And indeed, P.C. Mukherjee and also Vincent Smith, the great Buddhist historian, at that time both were absolutely certain there is no other site which so resembles the descriptions of the Chinese pilgrims or the location as Tilorakot, published in 1901. Now, what is interesting, published in 1901, at that point, the Buddhist world accepted the identification. Next slide, please. It all changed in the 1960s because of an excavation here by the northern rampart at ancient Tilorakot. Next slide, please. And there, a team in the 1970s at that point identified what she saw as an impossibility within the chronology and also the fact that in her view early Tilleracoat was not fortified. Next slide please. Now at that point while some people were focusing on Piprahawa on the other side of the border actually a team of Japanese archaeologists from Risho University and here is a team that visited in 2018 from Risho University, visited the site, and they excavated a series of monuments. Next slide, then. And then, also, 
the Department of Archaeology, Government of Nepal, and later with Lumbini Development Trust, began to undertake a series of excavations. Mr. Rijal and Mr. Mishra both did pioneering work at the site. They excavated and exposed the Western Gate and the Eastern Gate. Next slide, please. And also the twin stupas to the north and promoted the fact that their archaeology identified a much earlier history to the site, back to the 7th or 8th centuries BC. Next slide, please. And indeed, about 20 years ago, as a young man, I had the privilege of doing some geophysics at Tillericoke, where we identified evidence of a grid plan below the city. So we knew it was a very important formal site. Next slide, please. But our challenge was how to move beyond just the board that says Kapilavastu. How could we understand the topography, the morphology? Next slide, please. So with funding again from the Japanese Funds and Trust from UNESCO, with the support of the Department of Archaeology, uh, and also the, uh, the Lumbini Development Trust, we moved focus to Tillericote Kapilavastu. Next slide, please. Now, this is the site that I first saw of Tillericote 20 years ago. And the challenge is, how can you believe this is a city? It just looks like grass and bushes. Next slide, please. But this is the topographical view from a UAV, from a drone. And actually, you see, it is very, very well defined. Next slide, please. And also, we use archaeological geophysics, because every brick, when it is fired, it changes its magnetic field. When it gets buried beneath the ground, it still keeps that change in magnetism. So doing a recording every 50 centimeters and plotting, you pick up areas where there are greater magnetic strengths. So this is the archaeological geophysics. On the surface, you just see grass. You walk up and down. Next slide, please. This is the city plan. Everywhere on this plan where you see dark, these are brick walls. The interpretation is the next slide, please. So this is the city plan. It measures about 500 meters by 400 meters. The blue lines are all streets. So the entirety of the city is divided into a beautiful, regular street system just below the surface. Next slide, please. Now, it's striking. This is similar to the Arthur Sastra which suggests that planning is already in place at the city, but also it's very similar to the descriptions of the Chinese pilgrims. Next slide, please. We also went back to that trench excavated by Debla Mitra to see how early is the site. Next slide, please. And we found actually the city was fortified in 6th century BC. So 6th century BC, there is the city fortification, but it's not brick, actually it's timber. So the entire city is walled with a timber fence first in the 6th century BC. Later, there is a clay rampart in about the 1st century, and later still, next slide please, there is a brick wall in the Kushana period with towers. Next slide please. Within the city, there are streets which are lined with shops and houses. Next slide, please. Many of those individual houses are perfectly preserved. Verandas, inner rooms, shops, streets. Next slide, please. And even in some of the squares, we found small shrines. Small shrines, public shrines. Next slide, please. And also, and this is interesting, there is civic infrastructure. So close to the center of the city, we found a very large geophysical structure measuring 30 meters by 30 meters. When we excavated, we found it is a brick-lined water tank in the middle of the city, dating to the Mauryan period, the period of the Emperor Soka. It is part of the city plan. Next slide, please.
This is significant because actually, if you think, between ancient Tillericote and the Kathmandu Valley, there are similarities, city plan and also the significance of water. Next slide, please. And when PC Mukherjee was there in 1899, he identified one area that he referred to as Palace of Buddha's Father. And this is his map. Next slide, please. This is where many pilgrims go because of that. Next slide, please. With the geophysics, though, we have found the evidence of a walled palatial compound in the center of the city, measuring 100 meters by 100 meters at the crossroads of the city. Next slide, please. And so we did geophysics. We did excavation two years ago. Next slide, please. And we have found the gate of the palatial compound, five meters wide. Next slide, please. And also, behind the entrance, a tower. So this is a huge, fortified, palatial compound at the center of ancient Tillericote. Next slide, please. And also, we found evidence of that wall going round this complex. So it's a very special complex, separated from the rest of the city by this inner wall for the palatial compound. Next slide, please. So even two months ago in February, we identified this new portion of the ancient wall surrounding the palatial compound. Next slide, please. Within that palatial compound, the buildings are much larger than outside. Some of them are 40 meters by 20 meters. These are very large palatial quarters. Next slide, please. They're all built in brick, unlike the ordinary housing outside. Next slide, please. The floors are all brick floors. So this is an, these are very deluxe properties. Next slide, please. And also, they're surrounded by very high walls. And we have evidence of ancient earthquakes where the walls have collapsed. But originally, the walls would have been three meters high to make sure that they were very secluded structures. Next slide, please. And within these buildings, we have found carved stone, like this beautiful piece of carved stone. Next slide, please. We also have a series of reliquaries, such as this is a stone reliquary. And if you look, you can see elephant and lotus. Sadly, the face is missing from the elephant, so we can't tell if it has six tusks, which, of course, would be significant. This is one of the objects which is going to um, uh, Buddha Vesak in Sri Lanka as part of the festival. Next slide, please. But also, we have sculpture of figures. Sadly, these are broken, but we hope to be able to understand more about who these individuals are. Next slide, please. Now, many of the buildings on the later part date to the Kushana period. And these are the ruins that the Chinese pilgrims, Fa Sen and Wan Zhang, describe. They're describing late brick-built ruins. Next slide, please. The levels associated with the life of the Buddha are three meters under the ground, and all of those buildings are built in timber and mud, not palaces of marble and stone, but at that time, people lived using brick, uh, using uh, timber and also mud. Next slide, please. But also, we have evidence that the site is first occupied 800 BC. So before it becomes a city, it is already a village. And we've been pushing its youth as well. Near the little Sai Mai Mai temple, we now have evidence actually of a Gupta period temple, very late temple. So the building is stretched in date. Next slide, please. The focus cannot just be on the interior of the city, but also its hinterland of religious structures. Next slide, please. And so with the geophysics, we've identified a very large monastery just to the south of the eastern stupa that some people refer to as the Kantaka stupa. Next slide, please. To the east, there is a major monastery. To the north, there are the stupas. 
to the west, there is the modern village. To the south, there is a huge industrial area bringing polluting industry outside the city planning from 400 BC onwards. Next slide, please. And this is key because now the government of Nepal is purchasing land to prevent these important sites from being damaged by farming or construction. Next slide, please. And even walking through the site, as pilgrims walk through, they damage the archaeology of the site. So the new walkways that uh, uh, the venerable vice chairman is constructing are timber. They are there to protect the heritage. Next slide, please. So you can see they're lifted above, so the heritage is not damaged. Next slide, please. And buildings are also being conserved because every year people say, you expose beautiful monuments, then you cover them. Please, can we see the monuments? So now conservation is ongoing. Next slide, please. Including some of what we believe are Sangaramas because when the Chinese pilgrims visit, they mention that there are a series of Sangaramas built on the ruins of the old palace. Here, we have very similar structures. Next slide, please. And we can begin to try and imagine what did they look like? What was it like to live, to walk around in the city? Next slide, please. Simple houses, some of the shrines. Next slide, please. We also see our duty is to engage with visitors, to educate, to offer interpretation. So we've been putting up signboards, Next slide, please. Small pamphlets for visitors. Next slide, please. And also visitors such as the Chief Minister Pokhrel came to visit. Next slide, please. And also we're engaging with school teachers. If we teach the school teachers, they will teach the children. Next slide, please. And also on occasions like this one with uh, Mr. Acharya, we get other special interests visiting uh, the city. Next slide, please. But also community engagement, because this is an area with something like 82% uh, uh, of uh, Hindu, but then a large percentage of Muslims. So we need to engage the population there. Next slide, please. Because they have expectations, they believe the development of the site will bring them education, employment, and infrastructure. Next slide, please. But many of them also visit the site frequently, so we must balance how we develop the site. Next slide, please. So this year, for the first time, we held a cultural festival which brought together handicrafts that brought together intangible heritage. Next slide, please. Looking at some of the material that is sold, for example, the elephants. Next slide, please. And, school, and we still have a challenge because the airport will be finished soon and then infrastructure, next slide, please, of roads, next slide, please, of hotels. This must be controlled to protect the landscape. Next slide, please. Because visitors spend very little time in Lumbini. They spend about 29 minutes. Next slide, please. And many of them then go back over the border and the rest of the Buddhist circuit is not visited. Next slide, please. This is an area of unbelievable significance and sacredness, but also in terms of archaeology and sites to visit, there are many. Next slide, please. By the geophysics, we can begin to understand the importance of these sites. Next slide, please. So, for example, we found a series of Kushana period forts along the old pilgrim road from Lumbini to Tilraco. Next slide, please. So actually, in the same way today, there is infrastructure for pilgrims. In the Kushana period, there were way stations to stop for pilgrims on that Maya Devi path between Lumbini and ancient Kapilavastu. Next slide, please. The sites are overwhelmingly significant. Aurora Coat, next slide, please. 
which seems to be again a Kushana fort. Next slide. Similar to Taxila in northern Pakistan. Next slide, please. Ramagrama. We did geophysics here at the invitation of the venerable vice chairman. Next slide, please. We found ancient tanks and monasteries all around the Vihar. Next slide, please. At Sagrahawa, where the Chinese pilgrims identified the massacre of the Sakyas, we found lots of very small burnt areas that now we identify tentatively as burning platforms. So this linkage between historical topography and archaeology is strong. Next slide, please. And at, Sagra, at Sicinia, we found a town. So this is a very significant landscape. Next slide, please. Now, we are helping how we can. Lumbini Development Trust with UNESCO and Department of Archaeology have produced this new brochure. There are signboards going up. Next slide, please. Working with partners, we can actually transform this landscape without damaging. Next slide, please. I am so grateful to my co-director, Mr. Kosh Prasad Acharya, who taught me much of what I know about Nepali archaeology, who is in the background. Next slide, please. But also, we've raised money for training. Archaeologists from Pakistan, Bangladesh, and Sri Lanka all came to join us in January and February at Tillerakot. Next slide, please. And this year is between funding from the Japanese government. This year was all paid for out of the personal pocket of one man, a Japanese philanthropist, Dr. Kasai, who when we had no funding this year, funded the entire season. So I have to say how grateful I am that actually his donation allowed us to make these discovery and this offer of training this year. This is highly significant. Next slide, please. So what I would say is, if you are able to come on the tour tomorrow, please ask me as many questions as possible. I apologize if I've overrun a little, but this landscape is of such significance that we have a very small opportunity to protect, to preserve, and promote it to balance pilgrimage with heritage in a way of sustainable pilgrimage. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you indeed on behalf of the organizers uh, for this very important keynote. Um, yes, deliberations would for follow today on, later, after this inauguration. And ladies and gentlemen, we hope that this keynote was uh, uh, I think more than keynote and more enough uh, to set that ambience and give us enough food to build on that deliberation based on the theme that we come to you. The theme this year is Lumbini, the birthplace of Lord Buddha and the fountain of Buddhism and world peace. So our deliberation, our presentations on the sub-themes that comes to you today and tomorrow would be certainly based, uh, would be building on the presentations that we made today. One more time, thank you Professor Robin Cunningham for this very valuable and important um, presentation and the incredible work that you all have been doing.